Welcome everyone. It's June 7th, back for another Node Operator Roundtable, and I'll start it off by handing it over to Brian. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good night, everyone. Um, thanks for joining the call. Uh, today, the, uh, the illustrious Stephen Diesel has joined us again. Um, he has been working on uh, def better defining an initiative for some peer-to-peer -peer, um, improvements. And he has some um, some things to bring to this group for feedback and uh, get some answers to some things. So I'm just going to hand it straight over to Stephen to do that, and then we'll move into um, discussing consensus upgrades after that. Stephen. Great. Um, hey, everybody. Been a minute. Great to see you all. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so one initiative that uh, we've, of course, talked about in the past and that we are working to prioritize in part for this upcoming release and likely one to follow is uh, some various improvements around P2P protocol. Um, specifically, we're, we're interested in solving just any sort of incremental improvements we can make around uh, the stability and reliability of the transactions in transit across that network, um, and also just improving node operator quality of life. So when we think about things like a couple more knobs to control uh, things like peer connection counts, bandwidth usage, stuff like that, as well as um, maybe even managing undesirable peers in certain ways. These are some of the places that we're initially inspecting and kind of our belief at this time is that we'll likely start off with just a little bit better um, observability around some of those things to build some learnings around things like uh, peer connection health and behavior. Um, but I did have a couple of questions for the team um, and then I'll kind of go back uh, to my notes from there and then hopefully present a little bit more cohesive uh, proposal for you guys in the next week or so. Um, the first question I had uh, was just really around whether or not there were any specific uh, peer connection behaviors that the group here wishes they had greater visibility into to learn about their connection health or if there's any sort of specific peer behaviors that outright block producers would like to more easily manage. Um, some examples of that would just be uh, any sort of instance where you're consistently receiving invalid transactions, um, you know, if they're persistently desynchronizing in some sort of way, uh, things along those lines, I can uh, read from my list a few more examples, but I'm interested to know if there's any sort of gut reactions from this team about like, oh my gosh, I can't stand when X happens, or I really wish that I had greater visibility into X, Y, or Z so that I knew more about uh, like my peer connections. Um, I also am aware that BPs often have a set list of peers that they connect to, but I'm still interested in, in your feedback around this. See, Michael's chomping at the bit there. It's come up quite a few times now, Steve. Um, I'm going to let you know the thing first. I got plenty. Uh, you got plenty. Yeah, I mean, we want to be able to connect to a node uh, that has the blocks that we require. Um, so some kind of understanding of how deep the block log goes on the peer. Um, the other one is which peer are we pulling our block log from? like what we're trying to sync with um there's a whole lot of like detail at the moment we don't have any detail as far as i understand right now you know we we just know that we've got some peers set up you might get something in the log saying you know it goes red error peer tells you you know to go away or something like that i think it actually says that <laughs> but um yeah information about where are you pulling your synchronization log from and don't want to be pulling from something that doesn't have the the blocks that we're looking for i'm looking for block number 10 million something 10 million something anybody you do you have anything no no we sit there and the node will just be like stagnant while it waits to eventually i don't know what what the signal is for it to go to another node sometimes it will go to another node at some point but i don't know information and uh, uh, awareness of our uh, node 
of what the nodes that it's connecting to have available. Yeah, basically, I agree with Ross. It's a black box. We don't know what's going on. Um, so, and the, the big behavior that's a problem is when it's not syncing or syncing slowly, right? Which comes down to peers that do or do not have the blocks. I remember when we first introduced the chopping off the block log and I had a conversation with Kevin. This was like years ago. My node is not syncing. I don't know why. And then after investigation, oh, do you think it's up here that actually has the blocks? Oh, right. Yeah, so I remember this example. So, uh, but still, the, the situation is not improved to know what's going on. That, you know, do you have to appear with the required blocks or not? And I tell you, you know, sysadmins just puzzle at it why it's not sinking for a long time. Yeah, I mean, that's like that. a pretty clear that's problem. Clear. Um, I want to know if the peer has the blocks that I need so that I can go elsewhere if needed. That That's, that's pretty clear cut and simple from a concept perspective. So noted there. Um, what else though? I think the PR that Kevin just posted in the chat addresses a lot of these concerns. It, it addresses that specific concerns. There are, are still lots of pain points, but yeah, it does. We, we, we have actually tackled that already in 5.0, but there's, there's certainly many more areas of improvement that can be made. Of course, I've mentioned it before, but the bi-directional chatter of peer-to-peers. So Kevin may have a head start on that, but Ross had also, you know, we can very easily see inbound and outbound always seem to be in lockstep with each other. Yeah. Why? Yeah. You would think outbound would be more right? If you've got like a public peer. Correct. If, if, if it was yeah. one coming in and I'm syncing it to the 18 people that are 72 people, but 200. <laughs> every, yeah. You would think that it's i uh, I'm getting one in and I would see it 70 fold on the way out, but it's not it's in lockstep. So it's almost like it's always ping pong <laughs> or, or I don't know. I, so anyway, I, I would say there's definite inefficiencies in just how it tries to sink and, and does sink. Uh, also, you know, it's this battle of it asks the same five or three servers or 10 servers for the same information over and over and over. So we always say you want to sink and not just crush it, remove it down to one peer it's low latency and it'll scream in comparison to 10 peers. I mean, it's just totally counterintuitive, but it's because, and you'll watch your bandwidth usage go from 20 meg down to two, you know? And so things like that, just in whatever. I'll also say, and I have no details other than just graphs. I feel like people are figuring out ways to come in through the peer to peer, so somewhere along the line, only because I can see a normal peer stays connected. I mean, unless it's disturbed, it's pretty consistent. I mean, I've seen issues where it'll go from 70 to 150 and, and then just, you know, plumb it back down to the original 70. And it's like there, there was something in there that wasn't a normal peer to peer. It, it's not that normal open session continued stacking. So, I mean, I feel like and I have no clue what they were doing. Obviously, it's a black box. We were just getting data and sloughing it off if it was bad. But um, I think that versus an API, which I have way more control over, and it's HTTP traffic, and I can sniff it and roll it. Here's just the mercy of wide open, let it rip the TCP. Are there any specific things, like if, if we were to shed some more light on this, that you would assume would be some of the more helpful things to know about a, a peer connection that could confirm what you think that behavior is. It sounds like you don't quite know what's happening here. You're saying it's abnormal. Um, from your experience, what are some of the things that you'd like to have visibility into to successfully diagnose this and then maybe even support future development to better manage those sorts of connections or behaviors? 
okay. Like say, on that one, I don't, I don't know the best answer. I mean, there is the peer plugin. So I mean, or there's the peer. Which which one is it? That the node plugin, whichever one it is, where you can control your peers and see your peers and status like that. I don't know how useful you know it is for chasing, but I, I don't be, know. Is that... It would be great if we can have you know, like a standalone tool that could be part of maybe leap util or something that can deal with this peer plugin and show you something like an H top or like a top, you know, that shows you all your connected peers. Yeah. What's the current bandwidth being used for each one incoming or outgoing? What's the last synced block? What's their current block range and allowed you to disable or, or add peers that would at least give us insight of where the problem is, uh, if there is a problem and, and how best to tackle. So that, that, that might just be academic though, and it's cool. I want that visibility. I want to know what's going on. What you actually want is for it to be intelligent enough to um, select the most appropriate pair. So that kind of detail is great. I mean, it's cool. We can go and we can see what's going on when we do have an issue, but that's only like when you want to open the, open the hood, right? right. Most of the time you, you want, you, you want the, the node itself to use that data in order to make the right kind of decisions about what to do. But like that's what PR215 like does in a way, right? It, it, it like shows you in the notice message, like the range of the blocks. It allows you to limit the number of uh, nodes you're going to connect to, even if your list is longer. So it will only connect to nodes that actually have the blocks uh, you want and the ones and like sort them by lowest latency. So there's already work, at least I'm seeing now that's being done in that. But I mean, to find those more anomalies and potential uh, problems, like a view like that, where, you know, most node operators have, like they're looking at Netstat, they're looking at other things, but to have it kind of in a unified view will be easy to detail those issues to, to the developers. Exactly. And it, it's, it's a build, measure, learn process, right? I, I know that uh, the end goal shouldn't be that like, hey, it'd be really great if Ross, you could just like go look in there and, and tell me how we can fix your problems. But that that's that's one step along the way, right? We we start to increase that visibility so we can identify those patterns so that we prioritize development work to make it that easy button of just like, oh, it is managed for you automatically. And we are progressing towards a healthier network in, in general over time. Um, I'm interested to know, and this isn't um, a accusatory in any way uh has anyone had any opportunity to uh consume and experience any of the improvements that have been introduced in 4.0 and does anyone have any feedback specifically around p2p as it pertains to those new features um and if not can i ask anyone to do some homework and give us feedback ross you probably i haven't yeah. no i haven't done it. i haven't I haven't done any, I'm running four as of like, um, this week. Um, and I haven't done any like uh, specific feature testing. I, I found some issues with EP, uh, leap util. I need to actually log a, um, uh, issue, but, um, no, I haven't, I haven't done any, I haven't done anything more than that. And Shaq, it sounded like you were at least looking into the PRs right now. Have you had any exposure yourself? Today. Yeah, well, uh, we just um, I ran into an issue on um, on EOS itself, where the node will just be consuming like there was only like upland mainly transactions, but the node will use like a ton of CPU, and it didn't make much sense because the block wasn't very full, wasn't you know uh, like it didn't make sense to me. But I was on the old version. As soon as I upgraded to four point zero point one, it was using like two percent again of CPU. So that's not like Oh yeah, specific problem. But that being said, we are finally like uh, we're testing now the 4.01 for our UX network um, with like small modifications, and I'm running like some tests, starting to run some tests, mainly on like parallelization and uh, you know return value and read-only transactions. But uh, also, I'll be able to provide more uh, feedback after I do that. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, any feedback that you guys do have, excuse me, is wanting to steal the show, but uh, as that feedback comes along, I'd love to receive it and be kept in the loop around that. Um, 
Is there any other feedback specifically around undesirable behavior that we may wish to bring greater exposure and visibility to as an initial step? I'll say one last idea I've been holding that was on that inefficiency of syncing peers and catching up of nodes. One thing that popped into my head is that maybe when you're in that, what I call the, the mad dash to catch up the lib, you know, when you know you're behind lib, you start syncing in mass and doing whatever. If that mode were more intelligent and fine, just pick one and rip on it, maybe keep a state and check others or whatever. But I think it's kind of the problem of peer to peer needs to be pretty active and synchronous to just make sure that node stays in sync and and you know head block but if you know that you're in catch-up mode which is basically three minutes whatever behind and live and it already is intelligent enough to sync it differently versus block 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 so i think that may be you know an easier win uh instead of changing the whole protocol as it is to any other ramifications that may come from a node not spamming everything to try to keep in sync. But if it's in catch up mode to pull to know to pull itself back, because yeah, this PR says default three or five or ten or whatever. You can manually manage your list, but you're having to manually figure it out even anyway. But if it can just say, look, I just need one of you guys. <laughs> That's the best if that one doesn't have it, fine. Move to the next one. You know, I mean but that might be a quicker win versus the whole rewrite or something. Anyway, I'll stop. Gotcha. So what 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 are you saying needs to change specifically in catch up mode? You're just saying that it should... it's related to that inefficiency of the peers. And well, if you've got five, it's going to try them all. It's going to keep asking them for the same info and and yeah, visibility. You know to go and trim them down. This one's working. These aren't. Whatever. But ultimately, all we're tracking, like Ross said, visibility is great. What I really wanted to do is just be like, I don't need to look at it. Damn it. Just like an Ethereum node does. It says, who the hell's out there got my data? Give it to me in the most efficient way possible. Oh, shit, that peer went offline. Ah, let's try to find another one in the list. But in that lib catch-up mode is really where that's painful. And you don't need the... the <laughs> peer-to-peer -peer virus, which is the, you know, it's yeah. really efficient at, at making sure everybody's on the same page. Gee, that's, I think, what kills it when you're sinking 300 million blocks. <laughs> yeah. So what, what I'm hearing from you is it would be great if during catch-up mode, I could identify the peer or a very small bucket of peers that are the best peers to get in sync from. Yeah. Which I, if I could, but it, I mean, automatically, you know what I mean? That, that, yeah, yeah. I'm, say, I'm, I'm just talking about your needs because that, that's where we'll right. start. Okay, so I, as a node operator, would like if it can kind of automatically figure <laughs> that. Anyway, I just want to make sure because one's visibility, one's, you know, kind of intelligent on, nah, peel back and tell them in sync and then let it rip again. Just an yeah. idea that popped into my head. Yeah, so... What I'd love to transition to from here is I got some great feedback around some of like the undesirable things. And we started tapping into the flip side of that. And that's what I'd like a little bit more feedback on is uh, what are some of the desirable behaviors? Obviously, like if so-and-so has the data I need, I like them better, right? Um, if like, like what, what are some other bits that matter? I'll give you another example that's been discussed, um, which is just uh, first blocks received, which just suggests that um, however you're receiving those blocks, there's a strong connection and speed at which it's coming from the BP to whomever to you. Um, I'm interested to know what are some other signals of quality of health of connection that we could eventually look to solve via programming to really <laughs> zero in on that group of the good peers. So what makes a good peer? I think you almost said it there, the low latency, high, high throughput. A yeah. And a, a complete amount of data. Well, complete for the set that I need. For yeah. Like, um, Steven, I, I feel like you've got, like you're asking these 
questions. They're almost pointed. You have got some ideas. Is there anything that you wanted to share with us about it? Um, no, like you, not, there's obviously not. some conversation that you've already had with the team. So I feel like they're all kind of loaded. Like, hey, you know, like you, you, you guys have got some ideas. Well, well, yeah, let's face it. I mean, there was an original RFP that was written for P2P improvements. This discussion isn't new. Um, I will be transparent and say that uh, the revival of this conversation is a bit more fresh. Um, so I'm taking some old ideas and trying to get some more material feedback from the end user here. So that, that that's what's happening here. But I mean, what we want to do, obviously, is we want to find strategies where we connect to the right pool of peers to make the syncing process as efficient as possible. We also want to slowly clip off any of the peers that are problematic because that's just a form of waste. Um, and I love eliminating waste where possible. So those are the main things that I'm talking about. But like the how, I, I don't actually as a product person own um, like the the how i'm much more of like the the why and understanding the needs that you guys have and that's where i partner with engineering to actually say like how the heck can we do this thing um and we're kind of like living right in between that here which is helpful so i don't i don't have anything crazy to to show you or anything we, we like obviously like these are just like lists that we'd want to manage and label those peers in some sort of way so that we can better control them. But um, I'm honestly not qualified to say what that how is. So is there any advantage of um, like labeling certain peers as like, this is an internal peer, this is an external peer. And then maybe that would help from a reporting perspective or deciding what to do later. Yeah. So like, for example, we've got a whole bunch of peers we run internally. But then our public peer-to-peer -peer node, and I, Michael has showed his architecture diagram of this, right? We have all these massive incoming peers, and then we have all these internal ones. And the behavior that we want from an external one and an internal one, maybe they're different. Or maybe, you know, if we're trying to collect metrics, separating those two things, uh, you know, is a different thing. Now, the internal peers might come in, like they might connect as well, or we might they might be outgoing. In our environment, we, we cross-connect everything. A connects to B, B connects to A. Node.us figures out that there's duplicate connection and drops one of them. But then that's like a bit inconsistent from reporting. Well, is it an in or is it an out? Well, sometimes it's an in, sometimes it's an out, depending on which node restarted last. But if I could label it, uh, this is an internal connection. This is an external connection. So I think I filed an enhancement request like way long time ago in the block one repo, which says, you know, the, the, the config line for the peer-to-peer -peer connections in config.ini is getting to be this very long thing with, you know, colons and weird delimiters because, you know, this is a blocks only connection, but it with a BP, whatever. It's getting complicated. It needs like a more detailed structure. And like in our environment, we put a comment line above each peer-to-peer -peer line. And then when we build our UI that shows the status, I can say, oh, it's for this block producer. It has this name. It has this. But anyway, I have a structured comment line that I know how to parse. Um, so the automation writes the config I and I, and then we have automation that reads it and we can build nice dashboards out of it. But, you know, that's an, a hack built on top of the, the structure. So, you know, if we're trying to build a dashboard or some comments about which is in, you know, this is the public seed peers and this is the internal ones. Maybe we can distinguish that. So you yeah. want to add like a label, like a comma, you know, to the peer to a here, yeah. you like then put add a comma, add an optional label, and that way yeah. there could be a group. You can treat it any way you want in your consuming the porting stuff. Yeah, it would be a label. So, for example, if you were doing a Prometheus exporter and grouping things by something, then you could use that label of a you know a field, and then you could generate a Grafana fire. Yeah. yeah, different by those levels. I don't know, just an idea. No, it's, I think it's, it's a sound idea. Um, I think that the other thing that kind of comes along with that is, um, you know, just a level of trust with those connections uh, is materially different. Um, so yeah, cause yeah. they are, they are, they are different, right? So one of the things we're talking about here is how do we efficiently sync blocks? Well, let's take the opposite is how do we control users who decided that we're their best peer and they want to take, you know, 
200 terabytes of block. Okay, well, it's not 200 terabytes, but you know, the block logs are getting huge. So, well, now they want all of it from us. Well, that's a bit, you know, nasty. Maybe we need to be able to disconnect them after a while. Well, you got enough blocks for now. Go away. Come back in half an hour. Right? Try another peer. Yeah. Or maybe we're being malicious and sending you all the wrong blocks and you just got them all from us. So now you have the wrong block log. I'm, I'm sure uh, engineering has already thought about that problem. But just thought I'd mention here anyway. So yeah, so in the Ethereum community, I can see there's tons of discussion. People are creating weird peer-to-peer -peer clients and blocking peer-to-peer -peer legitimate connections. And now, you know, nodes have to understand this and auto-ban people for, you know, not respecting the protocol. And they, you know, those clients get banned. So anyway, <laughs> we have, I don't think we have that behavior here, um, but, you know, that will happen. If there's value in having that behavior, then people will do it. Well, that brings me to like sync, uh, this new sync period limit idea. Like once it selects based on lowest latency and say you have a hundred um, configured peers in your, you know, in your uh, node uh, EOS, not that you should do that, but say you have a hundred and now you set your sync period limit to, to 10 or five. How, how often do the others get re-evaluated? Because in this current scenario, they'll be like, oh, ES Nations is best. It has all the blocks I need. It's going to just keep it at the top and they're going to get abused by everybody without any kind of rotational mechanism or or um, distributed kind of uh, load on, on the other peers. So the question is really this sync period limit. How frequently do the other peers that didn't make it to the top list, get requested for you know how many blocks you have and what's your latency. Oh, well, it's rather continuous. Um, the um, for latency, it, I, I believe it's every five seconds. For um, the, the the range, it's every handshake, which can be at least every five seconds and often more often than that. I'd say that may fall into Matthew's comment about. Let the peer try to do the most efficient sync it can. If you don't want to get ripped, have like a time window and a maximum per, you know, and say, look, I see that this peer is, is already downloaded two gigs this hour. Tell them to go away for the next 30 minutes, which should then trigger the client to be like, ah, crap, Nations didn't give me blocks anymore. Guess I'll try another one and then step its way through because otherwise it's probably going to have to do a lot of work and be like, oh, I don't want to make the operator mad. So I'm just going to shift over. Nope. That one didn't work. That one didn't work. That one didn't work. That one didn't work. All right. Back to nations anyway. You know? Yeah. I mean, like I can see this kind of behavior. Like I was thinking a bunch of tenderman chains and it seems like if I don't offer any blocks, then the peers don't want to connect to me. And once I've got a couple of blocks, then the, the number of peers that I'm able to connect to seems to grow, you know? So my, my willingness to participate in the peer to peer network, you know, incentivizes other people to connect to me or something, right? Because it, this is a like behavior, well, especially, I, I mean, Node.js doesn't have this feature, but like in like most of the other blockchains, you know, they, they, they will automatically contact the UPnP if your home firewall router thing supports UPnP, it will automatically open the firewall port and then allow users to connect in. I don't know, big security hole from my perspective, but anyway. Good. Uh, but this is the behavior. People expect you to be able to connect to that peer and then start exchanging information. So, because you're trying to build a whole network of people, right? In, in Leap land or Antelope land, you know, everything's hard coded and you know, there, there's no auto discovery, so that, that doesn't happen. Well, you, you know, there is some kind of auto discovery, and, and Kevin, maybe you need to correct me on this. If I've got a node um, that I uh, publish as a peer, and I get 200 people connecting to me, I also pull from those peers that they connect to me, right? Yeah. So, correct. Yeah, yeah. So when there's 200 of them, and the thing is going ballistic, and like. It's the decision about which one to actually pull from. That's the thing. You know what I mean? It's like, it could just be absolute chaos. And I, 
I mean, I, I know that I can see it's, it's total chaos on our published nodes on some chains where, you know, there's, you know, 500 mega megabits of internet bandwidth being used for whatever peer, whatever. And that node's actually also choosing to uh, pull some of the blocks from some of those peers when maybe it should, you know, and as far as this config goes, maybe it should choose some of the ones that you've got internally first. I don't know. I know obviously you don't want to get into a situation where you're in like a loop where you're only looking at your own nodes and then suddenly you don't have any blocks, right? But um, I think Matthew was like concerned with getting like his node abused, which is more like setting certain limits, like like if it added like maximum blocks per peer per time period or, you know, some limit to that uh, or like maximum bandwidth throughput to a certain peer after which there is like a, some type of delay or uh, go it's like a, for five yeah or, or it's like aloha where they were alphabetically first in the list and the way it used to just go down the list <laughs> they caught everybody's peer connection because <laughs> they were always the first one so it you, you find yourself working hard to become the favorite to get abused even more but yeah. i think it also ties into what you're saying is that well how do i keep a node from just trying this, you know, to go and try other ones. I don't, I don't think you do. I think you, you want it to operate as efficient as possible. It's up to the node operator. And I think maybe a time window and a blocks per or gigabytes, per, cause really it comes down to, <laughs> I don't, the number of blocks may vary dramatically, right? You're thinking the first couple 10 million blocks. Cool. I can rip that in a couple of, you know, sync spans. Oh, you bandwidth. want block 300 million? Oh, no, that's a whole nother level of, you know, here's 10 megabit for the next 30 seconds. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's really a bandwidth bandwidth. limit, not a block limit, right? Yeah. So, like, for all these internal peers, like, if we go back to my labeling or tagging thing, right? I don't care. They can suck as much as they want. When it comes to an external connection, wow, there's a limit now. Or maybe there's a limit for that group. We've exactly. got it's divided evenly across the the, the set. Right? It's almost like you can add a label that can be used, that can be applied one or more times to each uh, peer that you choose to do that, and a place in the config where you can add some type of limit root, where the something label. like that, where like yeah, to the label which will act either as a group or as a unique identifier depending on how you set it up. And I mean, yes. there's really two types. I mean, there's your peers that you're connecting to that you can obviously label. But a lot of what we're kind of talking about is I'm just wide open and until a limit gets hit. You know, yes, there may be an agent name coming in, but those are, you know, and they don't have labels. They don't really know. You almost kind of got to, I guess, treat them all as external connections versus like an internal one that you can label and say, look, don't cap that one. Do do apply this one, but yeah, yep. But at yeah. the same time, I don't want to get overboard with a million configurations. Either. Correct. That's what I say. I mean, it's, it's, it's... <laughs> I agree, and I mean, we are definitely like wading into the waters of of solutioning here, which is a risk to do too soon. But I think it's it's pretty evident that I, as a node operator, need to be able to set different constraints around. Uh, how I evaluate the quality of my internal versus external connections like that. That's pretty obvious. And we, we can take that and see what the best way is to manage that. And I'm also hearing that the greatest thing that a node operator cares about is bandwidth consumption from external peers. That That's something that we need to better manage. Like if there was one thing that we could improve, that's the thing that I'm hearing is, is the most important for us to to make some change on. Am I hearing that correctly? I'd say yes. And it's piggybacking on the previous. Okay, I've got better control of three peers and try the next one. Now you give the ability for the node operator to have policies for a go away message. You can come back later when somebody else tells you to go away. Uh, one other, and it's a very, very, you know, kind of granular type of thing, but I got burned on Matthew, it is uh, a peer being relay only or you know you can sync for me all day long 
but don't try to shove transactions to me. There, you know, I mean, that intelligence or a flag, you, you talk about how it che maybe checks latency or blocks or whatever, and I know it's extra data and whatever, but if it knew whether a, the remote peer was configured to accept transactions or not, don't, you know, I I got myself into a situation because I have no clue. I just got a peer list, right? And if I test them, yep, they all sync. Oh, well, you, you know, I mean, <laughs> and it's real hard to know until after the fact that you're just shoving transactions into a black hole, because it's just taking them and being like, Haha. so thought process on that, obviously a much more selective uh, grouping of set, but that's it. That was an interesting thing. Unless they tell you and you know, <laughs> you're trying to trim it down and all of a sudden you got two or three connections you're syncing to. And it's like, cool, I'm happy. Oh shit, that was a read only note. <laughs> Did you mean to do that? Anyway, so yeah. that was kind of a I'll just take a moment to defer to the chat and uh sing Kevin's praises and that uh it sounds like we are answering some prayers along the way. Um so all the more reason to try out 4.0.1. Um Yeah, but just just coming back just to pile on this a bit. If we're auto selecting peers and we auto selected the peers that have the best latency and all those ha have the best latency only except blocks, then our transactions will go nowhere. Yeah. Right. That's where it kind of came from was, was I was manually paring it down. Right. But if, if we're starting to do this auto thing and then the auto doesn't understand whether it accepts blocks or transactions, that's the problem. Well, hopefully, yeah. you, you know, it will, it does now, but we need to consider that. Even if the, the peer is very far away and it's the only one that accepts transactions, well, we got a peer with it. And maybe that's only if it's in head block, right? You know, I mean, yeah, if it's catch up mode, then of course we don't need transactions. So who cares? Correct. So, you know, I can kind of, and that, that's where. <laughs> I, I wouldn't hit that <laughs> way up on complicated. Yeah, and, and then your well is a node actually even want transactions. Is it in a read only? I mean, you can really go down the rabbit hole. And that's why I say I, I wouldn't put it high on the priority list. But it, it does kind of tie into that is that I've backed myself into a corner at a block producer, which was really bad. <laughs> but even as an API, you can just be shoving them into la la land and the node just sloughs them off. And, you never realize it until you got transactions that none of them ever get to chain because they all look successful to you. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, yeah, I want to get rid of those block only peers. But anyway, sorry. Go. Yeah. P2P accept transactions was around from version two or even before. Like, it was around for a very long time. I don't know if the change that Kevin is talking about is more that now the node will not send transactions to the yeah, peer, but the option was there, like, in, you know, using diffuse since the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. It's been around for a long time, but it, it simply dropped the transactions as they came, came in. The change in 4.0 is to actually communicate that out to the peer and tell it, Hey, you can send me transactions, but I'm going to drop them. In which case then it will stop sending transactions. Um, but it turned out that all the plumbing was there to make that happen. And so it's, actually backwards compatible uh, without, like you don't have to have 4.0 on both sides. You only need 4.0 on, on the one side that you've configured it and it will communicate that out. Yeah, yeah, which is kind of cool that it just happened to work out that way that we had the plumbing we needed to port it on, on older peer. Okay, thank you. All right. If we do end up going there, the route of groups for peers or labels or groups that does open up a whole potential things, right? You can set priorities, who gets the blocks first. You can do so much, uh, with that, but obviously like might add, uh, complexity. Will add complexity. <laughs> That's definitely the case. Um, I, I think it's a sound idea though, um, how actually we'd apply it is something that I think needs more exploration. 
I think one thing that's clear is just obviously the internal versus external. Like that, that's obviously like a place we can start and dig into. Um, any other questions on this? Um, any other thoughts about areas we may have missed around pain that you guys experience as it pertains to P2P? Uh, I mean, we really mostly talked about just like, how do we manage our peers better? Um, which I think makes sense, but are there other areas that you guys would like to discuss for today? I was wondering if there's a way to deter, to tell the node or to configure a node EOS that maybe I do have the full block log, but now since we have this, you know, splitting of the block log and some users may be like, okay, you know, like the super old blocks I'm going to put on a flatter drive that's great for my internal consumption, but it can't really serve the masses. So maybe I want to put in my config, like only sync blocks, you know, uh, that are maximum 1 million blocks away from head. Don't share any other blocks because now you do have options in storage of the different uh, splitting of the block so that might become a factor. It's interesting. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I assume that there's not a lot of peer visibility into kind of how that block log is split up and managed and anything like that. Yeah, I think Ross had kind of mentioned at the start the uh, making sure it understood split log, which I don't think it does, or did y'all add that back in? Yeah, no, it, it doesn't. I mean, all it knows is whether you have the block or not. It doesn't care about where that block lives uh, on disk. Well, when it's, when it's archived off to a slow disk, if it's still serving it, right? If that, it's all meshed back together now. Um, that was the big complaint with the original 2.1 implementation is that you couldn't split it across the disks. I, I assume that got fixed in 4.0. I, I believe we did fix that. Yes. Um, pretty sure that that's it. Right. And the point that we're making now though, right. is just that awareness of where that block log comes peace lives and uh, just how painful and consumptive of various resources it would be to access it. Um, okay. That, that's an interesting last little thing to chew on. Um, any other thoughts? Uh, if you're looking at internal or external, the external connections may come through a load balancer, so they look internal. Correct. And I, I hadn't quite figured out the best way <laughs> to fix that. Cause yeah, it's all my source destination, all my source addresses are all the source addresses are the local network. Right. Um, <laughs> but again, <laughs> and so it, yeah, fine if you've got headers and stuff, but whenever it's, you know, just kind of dumb TCP traffic, it, yeah, it kind of gets lost out there, then you don't really know. Yeah. Cause the, the load balancer can't do anything. It's just a TCP traffic redirector. It, uh, it's not, it's not application aware right so mm -hmm. but uh you know uh michael yates did build a uh javascript version of the peer-to-peer -peer protocol so maybe uh we need a more intelligent peer-to-peer -peer, uh traffic redirector i know so maybe maybe instead of adding a whole bunch of features in node us we need to add, write a intelligent proxy server that does deals with this Seth, I see you're on the call. I mean, didn't you guys have some ideas about, I know from the API side, did it include peer-to-peer -peer routing? Sorry to put you on the spot. You may not be listening. <laughs> Maybe not. Um, at the moment, it's only uh, regarding like pushing transactions in. The P2P is like later on. Gotcha. I didn't know. It was already on the table. But yes, I mean, we all fight our battles with, I just load balance it and <laughs> slam it around. And, and yes, I, all my peers have, have no connection limits because otherwise my proxy server gets banned. <laughs> yeah. Two from the yeah, same the, IP. The, the connection limits are implemented on the proxy server, not on the peer to peer node. Because it has just no way of knowing. And I'm not sure the best way around that, to be honest. But, I mean. I think that's a very good idea to um, to not complexify the node EOS and almost have like a, a separate product that 
it deals with the peer plugin and you know gives you more stats as well as uh, allows you to act as like kind of a firewall for for Node.js for a browser. Prometheus. Yeah. yeah, Prometheus stats, correct. I know you don't like it. No, 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 not Prometheus stats from Prometheus or whatever it was. Oh, Prometheus. Uh, Patronus. Patronus. Yeah, Patronius. Patronius. Yeah. Patronius. Do, do, do you know, I was running Patronius on all last week before I did the app call, week before. And okay, I was, it was still running. <laughs> right. Of course, course I, I was really running it like a year ago or something. But yeah, I was still running it for a while. <laughs> and what it was, was an intelligent standalone app that allowed, I mean, I think it was kind of like uh, the Boyd team that you needed the API routing. But I don't know, they may have done peer-to-peer as well. So but I was just saying, yeah, if you admit, like, the, the size of, you know, transactions coming in that you will to accept, as well as, you know, support with field to ban or something else for, you know, abusers. Yeah. <laughs> well, now we're really doing solutions instead of... Yeah, I, I, we're digging whatever. up solutions. <laughs> I'm trying to be nice, but I was going to say... Uh, it, all right, can we kind of take this back to the needs? So like I, as a node operator, don't want to add complexity to, to Nodios. Get it? That's fine. Um, I hear this uh, challenge in terms of identifying and labeling peers that are being managed via a load balancer. Um, trying to think if without just supporting the solution that you guys are presenting, how we can uh, talk about these problems a little more. Well, I don't know if there's anything else to add. I think we gave you the okay. requirements. Yeah, let's say you have the user story. I mean, I can you think of 20 different ways to slap a header on it. Um, yeah. All right, should we move on to the next topic? Uh, I think uh, Carvin wants yeah. to talk with something. I, I think that's great. Um, thanks, guys, uh, for all that feedback. It's very helpful. I appreciate it. And um, next steps for me is that uh, I, I will return to this meeting either next week or week after with a little bit more cohesive vision around um, what we're going after on this front. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch, but I'll kick it over to Daniel. I think, thank you very much. Uh, sorry, go I was just going to say, something. we might not have enough time for to like actually go into this topic in, in depth, but uh, you know, we could probably tee yeah. up next week thing. Go ahead. I, I don't think I have a lot. Yeah, I just, I do I really, really, I just want to get the bug in people's heads. The, the wrong uh, there's a consensus upgrade on her reason these things come up quick time flies when you're having fun uh so i believe 5.0 is expected around september correct me if i'm wrong even or brian and is that when the final release is expected to be made available or does the ENF have any strategic need to have the features activated on the main net in september Right. Maybe so, you don't have um, the answer right now. We, we, we don't really have the answer right now. Um, and any dates I throw around right now are absolutely tentative. Um, but I, I, high level expectations I, we would hope to have in late August, sort of like uh, release candidates happening. And then in the September, October timeline for consensus upgrades to hopefully occur. Um, but that's that's all rough and tentative, um, and we'll of course communicate as we get um, as we get closer and and our confidence increases. Cool. Well, the the typically now we've we've gone through a, a few of these um, now, and the biggest challenge with the consensus upgrade is really the coordination with the exchanges. The app, making sure everyone, you know, we're, we're pretty well connected, you know, well, the node operators we, we meet here, we have also the, the monthly BP call where it's, it's pretty easy to co coordinate with the block producers, but it's, um, the challenge is making sure that when we activate the exchanges are all still working, um, which takes, takes a lot of lead time and preparation and putting together all the materials and knowledge giving people a test net they can test on. Um, and in the most recent upgrade, we did have, there was a strategic need to activate sort of at a, at a particular time, which meant we had to sort of work back towards that date. And there was a little bit of a scramble, you know, I think, I think the final release came out a little later than it would have been ideal to meet those 
But if, the, if we had more flexibility, then rather than picking a date to activate, what I would recommend is actually we almost do like a once every once final release is out, almost have a go no go choose a activation date going forward from there. Um, and what we found in the past. Uh, so I'll throw a, a wrinkle into this, and this is early to uh, early to bring this up, but um, we are uh, ooh, we've recently internally discussed a um, a proposal for selectively using um, OC optimized compile like runtime for for actions on BP nodes. Uh, I won't go into all the details there, but in a future call, we will actually go into depth on that and the implications of that. Um, it is a thing that like may, with a huge underscoring on may, um, have implications to like how coordinated we need an upgrade to be, um, but <clears throat> still still too early to really uh, have a, a, a clear and concise description of the implications there. Um, but that, that'll be a future topic. So anyway, just wanted to throw that sure. out there. This may be sort of thing. Mm -hmm. but so yeah, ideally, basically from the time everything is, we have a final release, we have all the documentation, we have articles explaining here are the new features and why you should care. We have test nets giving about two months for the, the exchanges, the apps, everyone to prepare for that and, and test is, seems to be the ideal. Um, so again, if once we, we get some more clarity on, again, do we need to activate in September or are we more flexible with activation? And maybe we just, you know, maybe if, uh, final release is out around September and then we shoot to activate two months after that. Um, and then we would, you know, we'll get the EO support team to help coordinate communicating with all the exchanges, um, we would. We work with all the BPs to do all the testing on the test net. And obviously we'll have releases before the final release. We can start testing. Um, and, um, but really that's, that's kind of the main thing. Having, giving, giving people two months lead time with the file after the final release is out, we push, we push out some articles, we provide links to here's how you can connect to the test net. Here's all the documentation, knock on all the doors try to get people to respond to acknowledge that yes I'm aware there's a an upgrade coming and I'm ready um this this upgrade should be less complicated than the last one we don't have any of these going back from was it 2.1 to 2.0 and decommissioning history services and things like That's that so this should be an easier way that, that was the biggest ripple effect on the last protocol upgrade was the deprecation finally of that V1 history and a lot of exchanges tended to utilize that feature and found out towards the end, well, where'd it go? And of course, state history, V1 history, confusion, all of that, rolling back from 2.1. Um, as long as there's not like a big deprecation, you know, I think a lot of that pain, can they keep using the same progress going forward makes a big difference. Now, Brian, you mentioned, hey, if, you know, CPU, OC, something like that, if that were to result in an exchange, you know, not billing properly and not having its transactions percolate its way down, that is by far the single, not single worst, but your API operators, your BPs, all of us, you know, I mean, we're pretty much in tune. But right. what that, by the way, is for an exchange to have to change, that's the pain that they need two months plus. And then they scramble because they did it the last week. Right. Yeah. But if they and, don't even OC, they're going to to share. Or spin a proper gate. I'm sorry. I, I talked over you. What, what did you say? I was saying if a BP, if, if like other BPs enable OC and one BP or exchange didn't, it's not going to stop propagation of the TX. It's just going to be charge them more when they're producing uh, the BP that doesn't have OC enabled. Uh, so it guarantees that the user have enough resources regardless of where to use the block. Yeah, well, so there are caveats, uh, but I, I we shouldn't go down the rabbit hole just yet. Um, that'll be a much more in-depth conversation. Um, but rest assured that as we're talking through the approach there, 
we're we're considering those uh, things and trying to minim minimize um, potential. I just had one small but, thing. Mm -hmm. Sorry, but like uh, just so you're aware, like a lot of history solutions, for example, Diffuse and their instrumental node EOS or with DeepMind, usually these are not accepting transactions. They are not accepting P2P transactions or API transactions. They're in, you know, read mode kind of thing. So these ones are already doing OC. They already have OC enabled, all these nodes. So yep. if OC is now part of the, you know, normal infrastructure yeah. and people start abusing it because, you know, it's cheaper now to run transactions, it's going to create a much heavier load on these history solutions. So just to put it out there. Yes. Um, and it's, it's an interesting sort of uh, balancing consideration because you know, on the other hand, supporting more throughput is, is a benefit, right? But yes, you're right. Like doing that without addressing the, uh, making sure that, um, important infrastructure elements can handle that additional load, uh, uh, isn't, isn't going to work either. But anyway, that is a rabbit hole that we will go down in detail sometime in the future. Um, when we've, We've thought it through a little bit more than we have so far, um, and and can present it um, for you know identification of potential risks like that one, for example, that that we may have not considered. So, um, but anyway, I think we're pulling away from the consensus discussion. Um, we should probably center back on that. Yeah, and and that's really it for now. That again, if, if we can you know, now uh, it's in everyone's mind. Oh yeah, September is closer than than I thought. Um, I was, I was almost myself caught off guard. Yeah. Things, time flies when you're having fun. Um, but, um, yeah, so maybe we can come back to this, um, you know, keep this a recurring item on the agenda going forward and just keep checking in on how, how that's, how that's looking. And if there are any strategic reasons that we need to aim for a particular activation date, uh, identifying that as soon as possible will help us plan. And that's it for me. And I think that's that's the agenda. So thank you, everybody. Yeah, there was there was another topic that Corbin asked about. Um, but you know, we, we don't we don't need there. to we don't need to talk about it today. We can we can skip that for now and mm -hmm. talk about it next week or so. No 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 hurry from my side. Excellent. Uh, it's cool. just as we are still working on our deep mind consuming history solution. It's definitely a topic uh, that, that that's of interest for us. Yeah. So the spoiler is we we've we've put that particular initiative on hold, but we we've identified some alternatives we want to explore. Um, and when we, um, so when we discuss this next week, uh, it'll be interesting to get some yeah. thoughts on that topic. All right, because uh, like the new substreams with direct to browser stuff. <laughs> Okay. Yes, upstreams. And uh, yeah, looking forward to hear more about that next week. So um, let's let's uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up for today and see y'all in a week. Thanks, everybody. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, bye.